Hello and welcome to another episode of Brewery Towns, the podcast that talks about brewing beer throughout the country. My name is Matt and I am joined today by John. Hey. And where are you calling in from? Uh, from my cat's bedroom in Waco. Uh, <laughs> that, that sounds really nice. Not, not, not too oh, yeah. smelly? No, no, no. She's pretty good. Okay, well, are you ready for a good episode? I am. Let's do it. This one, this one's special. This one's near and dear to my heart. This is my hometown. So today we are going to travel to Reading, Pennsylvania. Now, have you been there? Or I have. I went with you, I believe. We do, You know, we probably had the saddest spring break destination of Reading, Pennsylvania, <laughs> 2017. Look, it was a good time. It, it was a really good time. We stopped at Wawa, like twice mm. a day mm-hmm. um, it was only about an hour away from everything <laughs> that's right that was, we went I, to philly for a day you know we, it, we saw a lot it, yeah it's it's a really great place and we'll get into some of the history and some of the breweries but yeah i we're going to be working on some other episodes in the area because like you said there's so many cities an hour away so maybe you'll join us again for the next one oh, i don't know yeah okay so the sources we use for this episode come from the Berks History Center and the Reading Eagle, the local newspaper there. Okay, so let's start with location. Reading is the county seat of Berks County. Berks County is located in southeastern Pennsylvania. Um, like we said, it's an hour from Philadelphia. It's an hour from what, Harrisburg, the capital, from Allentown, from Lancaster, from a number of different cities, including Pottsville, which I, I think we're going to do... Um, an episode about Yingling. That's where it's. I always we've talked about this before. There's Pottstown, right? And there's Pottsville. Yingling is is in the Ville. Yingling is in the Ville, and that is more north of Reading. Pottstown is is southern. Yeah. So Reading is along the banks of the Schuylkill River, and it is not far from the Appalachian Mountains, which is when we went on the Appalachian tra- Trail. It was about an hour away. Yeah, everything is. Mm-hmm. And. People may recognize this city because it has a square on Monopoly, the Reading Railroad. When? Well, it's obviously a very different answer for you than everyone else. Right. But at what age do most people realize that it's not Reading Railroad? I, I, for me, it was probably like somewhere in the late teens, which might be embarrassing. I don't care. I'd imagine people still call it that. I, I think when I see it on Monopoly... I mean, until we got to know each other really well, and I was like, and, and I heard, okay, Reading, Reading, you know. But even, so now if I see it, I'm like, oh, it's, it's Reading. Reading. I mean, it was 18, whatever, 19 years old. I was still like, oh, Reading Railroad. Love it. <laughs> see, that's just really, <laughs> it's just really funny to me. <laughs> uh, well, most people probably don't know about Reading because it's only a city with 90,000 people in it. Uh, pretty, pretty small, pretty. Um, insignificant if the Reading Railroad's the the thing that it holds to to everyone in the country. If that makes sense. Um, okay, so let's see the nicknames of Reading. It has two nicknames. One is Pretzel City. I don't know if you knew that. Didn't, no, I didn't know that. And then the other is Baseball Town. Baseball Town. And that and that's like uh, certified or trademarked. Are they so they are the baseball town? They are they are the baseball town, and they got that name because the area has a really rich baseball history. There's not like one famous person that's from there, but a lot of major leaguers actually are from Berks County, and they had a, oh, a really? they had a, a a lot of players that played in the All American Girls Professional Baseball League, which was oh. with that movie with Madonna, a League well, of Their Own. Or, League of Their Own. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, ready to get into the history. I have a question about the baseball town. Have, okay. Have they ever been sued by <laughs> Cooperstown? Hmm. Um, or, I don't know, Boston? I, 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 I don't know. I, I have no idea. I mean, or did they just get there first? They must think, I mean, I think when you think of Cooperstown, they probably are like the, the home of baseball or like, you know, the birthplace of baseball. Oh, just like a thousand variants on the same mm-hmm. basic thing. I see, I see. Mm-hmm. Our trademark law is just... Bizarre. Weird. Really bizarre. I don't understand it. But I'm glad you brought up Cooperstown. I've been working on an episode about that city. Really? 
Mm-hmm. See, I, that's another thing where I I don't you know you picture things in your head like reading rhetoric. Like Cooperstown to me is like just a building, <laughs> right? Right. It's just a Hall of Fame thing, and there's a stage that people are talking. <laughs> and, you know, right. they get their their thank thanking speech or their acceptance or whatever. Right. But, it's a, okay, it's a city too. That's it's, interesting. It's very tiny. I guess I, I definitely knew that, but it's it's very tiny. I think it's only like two or three thousand people, but they get like hundreds of thousands of visitors every year. Interesting. It's really, well, we, we'll awesome. save that. Yeah, yeah. Right, we'll save right, that. right. That'd be cool. Okay. Oh, one more thing. I almost forgot one of the most important things. You know, every episode we talk about a hometown, or or like someone that lived there for most of their life, and Reading, yeah, Pennsylvania, sure. is hometown to Taylor Swift. Wow. Mm-hmm. Were you, uh, like, in school with her at all or anything? She is from Y Missing Township, and I am from Exeter Township. So we, uh, apparently, apparently she lived on a Christmas a Christmas tree farm. So uh, that oh. that narrows it down because there's not many of those in Y Missing, I feel like. So we were probably, like, 20 minutes away. I see. Wow. I know. Just missed out. I know. And, uh, and oh, a tie here. The first time that I saw Taylor Swift was at a Reading Phillies game, which is the minor league baseball team in town. So what a little, fun, little fun, connection. I mean, yeah. Obviously, I'm assuming, not obviously, but I'm assuming before she like made it big, she was just like the local star. Yeah, she. she it, it was she after her first mom. album came out, so it was like Tim McGraw and Teardrops okay. on My Guitar. So she was she was on on the, the up and up. But, mm-hmm. Or the come up. I don't know how you say that. The, she was she was coming up. She was she was coming uh, up. Yep. But she she wasn't like she wasn't Taylor Swift yet. Yeah. You know? And okay. you know I know we're talking we're not really talking about breweries here but you know it kind of makes me it makes me upset because <laughs> it makes me upset because <laughs> she, she doesn't I feel like she doesn't have a good tie with Reading you know it's her it's her hometown I feel like she people think she's from like Nashville or something. She, right. Sure. You know. Yeah, that is that is surprising to me to hear that she's from Reading and, and the end. But oh. I digress. Should we talk about breweries here? Yeah, let's uh, let's talk about a little history first, and then we'll get into the breweries. Okay. Okay. So let's. Okay. So this is interesting. Reading is named after a town in England, and I always knew that growing up there, but I never knew what the town in England was named after. And it's actually named after an early Anglo-Saxon tribe. Redingus, which means people of the red root. Red root? Of the red root. Like, I, I'm thinking like turnips and like, uh, okay. uh, you know, root vegetables, I'm thinking. Or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Uh, so, well, I wonder if it's even carrot. Like, aren't wild carrots purple? Maybe it means oh, it's yeah. carrots. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what grows in England. You know, I, I assume everything. Plants, <laughs> probably. <laughs> Do they have, <laughs> is there soil over there? I've never been there. I think it's all rocks. That's what I see in the pictures. Okay, so named after that group, white settlers came uh, because of a land grant from King Charles II to William Penn in the 1600s. After that, William Penn's son mapped out the town in 1743, and then Reading was founded in 1748. So pretty early. Yeah, yeah, sure. It was a military base during the French and Indian War, and it also was a Hessian POW camp during the American Revolution, and the Hessians were the German, like, mercenary soldiers. Right, right. Okay, so let's get into some breweries. The first brewery in town was called Eckert Brewery. It was founded in 1763, so even before this was a country. Yeah. It was owned by Henry Eckert, and I... I, I always wonder this because I, I went to high school in Reading and our high school, one side of the, the school was bordered by Hill Road because it went up a hill and the other side was bordered by Eckert Avenue. I mean, it must be. Maybe a descendant. It, it, well, sure. it's spelled the same way. So I, well, I, just, I mean, it could have been like this guy's yeah, yeah. descendant, but surely it's the same family. Yeah, I, right? I, I, mean, I mean, there's no, there's no evident, correct evidence of this, but I, I like to think so. Let's assume so. Okay, so Henry Eckert, he sold the brewery to John Spoon in 1766, and he held it until the American Re- Revolution, excuse me, when he he became a captain he became a captain in the American Revolution, so he couldn't have a brewery anymore. Really? Okay, so he had to like divest. Right. From- 
and and I don't know if he died during it or if he's just like screw it I don't want this anymore because after the American Revolution was over a man named Jacob Bright was now in ownership of the brewery was it still Eckert it was not it was not so a big thing back during the 17 and 1800s was that the owners would just name it after their last name Oh, the, okay, so they would change the name to the mm-hmm. current owners. And we talked about this in a an episode we did a, a little bit ago in Wheeling, and sometimes the owners were actually prominent people in the city, so they wanted their name attached to their business, so it makes sense. Sure, yeah, sure. Okay, so Jacob Bright, he produced small, middle, and strong beer. Small beer was unfiltered and porridge-like, which I, I don't, it sounds interesting. <laughs> and it was it was the second running of a strong beer so you had the strong beer which was like eight percent and then you you ran it again i guess and you got small beer which was maybe three percent so it's like a, it's like a light mixed with like frosted flakes or <laughs> yeah very porridge like <laughs> i it it but but you but you see like a lot of these old beers they they um advertise them as a food drink Right. Sure. Like, so I, I don't know if they were actually thicker or if people just drank them for meals instead of like food. You know, like a stout kind of fills you up. Right. Yeah. I wonder if it was um, like we've talked before about um, uh, what was the brewery uh, that went under that was really popular um, out of Chicago. Or no, it was in Milwaukee. Oh, um, oh, uh, with the podcast episode. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <sighs> anyway, I've done my research. So that's good. Um, <laughs> But it's like you can see like sort of like the like yeast or something floating around in the beer. Mm. I wonder if it's they're just like we're not going to filter it at all and keep all of this in there. Uh, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> Porridge like this small small beer is actually comparable to <clears throat> what we call today a table beer. You, you'll see some breweries make these table beers, and it's brewed under three percent and it has a lot of nutritional benefits. If you ever see table beer, check it out. Okay. Pretty much everyone in town was a small beer drinker, and Jacob Bright actually allowed them to bring buckets, pots, and kettles to the brewery to fill up and then take home. I wish we could still do that. I know. It was like an early, like, growler system. Right, yeah. And, you know, you're just like, oh, I don't have a growler. That's fine. I've got, like, a gas can in the back of my car. <laughs> well, fill that up. During, during, like, the virus now, people are bringing, like, milk crates or, like, a gallon milk jug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And breweries are filling it up because they're calling it a, a growler. Because you can seal it, right? Right. You can it, just it, screw the cap on. Right, right. Yeah. So I thought that was we funny. Have, uh, we picked some up the other day that w- they had bottles, and they were saying, like, they're going to run out of bottles real soon. Yeah. I felt bad for buying the bottles. I was like, oh, yeah. I forgot to bring my growler. But then you have but to drink it, like, two, in, within a couple days. The bottles are nice because, they're, yeah, they're sealed. No. But, they're, you know, but I'm not going to complain about them having to drink the beer <laughs> that's right today. that's right <laughs> yeah yeah one of the breweries here in houston they actually ran out of crowlers so they yeah and then they they were like we can't even open this weekend we have nothing and they, and they you couldn't bring right. your growler because they thought it was unsanitary so they just weren't even huh. not going to be open until they get when more we, when we did bring a growler they they just like you know cleaned it in that mm-hmm. you know non-soap solution or whatever um, yeah but we also we we had some to go from like the pizza place that has a bunch of beers on tap mm. and they just like uh they called it a crowler but it's just in a like a ball mason jar oh yeah i saw that i think that's getting really popular too because those yeah. are every, you know those are everywhere and those are probably a lot cheaper yeah um than the the beer bottles yeah that's interesting but I don't know. yeah it's interesting to see what pl- different places are doing like some of the breweries they you have to order ahead of time and they put it out when you get there and then you have to grab it and you don't touch them at all but then some of them right you like literally hand them like your your growler and then they hand it back to you after like touching it so yeah i think it's just different levels yeah I guess. yeah but yeah anyway okay so that was happening in the late 1800 or the late 18th century um and at that time in the country brewing was, brewing beer was actually in a decline because distilling spirits was popular and the only reason that brewing remained was because of the german settlements and you think of germans and you think they drank a lot but they actually promoted temperate drinking habits and that included drinking beer because it was only like three percent 
over drinking vodka, which it would probably be upwards of like 60% if it's like moonshine. Yeah, yeah. So they're like, that, just have a beer. Right, right. And they it, won't get so hammered. Right, right. So the Germans were drinking beer. I'd imagine, like, I just think of like Scottish people or like English people drinking a lot of the spirits. I don't know if that's true or not. Sure. Yeah. I don't know. But because of this, Pennsylvania became the greatest brewing state because they had a very large population of Germans. And Philadelphia right. became the greatest brewing city at the turn of the 19th century. So good for them. Okay. Now, we're, we're still just talking, you know, in the, like, American colonies. Or I guess, I'm sorry, turn of the, yeah, that's how. Yeah, and, global, right? yeah, global. yeah, I mean, it would. But it we're would, not talking about globally, but just yeah. in, in the U.S. In, in, the, in, 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 the, in the U.S., the, the country of the continent. Um, and it makes sense because Philadelphia was, you know, the capital of the country. So it was probably, it was the greatest brewing city, but it was also probably the greatest, one of the greatest cities just in general. Yeah, just population, everything else. Yeah. Sure. Okay, so Bright Brewery closed in 1827 when he died. So that was the end of the Eckert Brewery tree. So it, so it lasted, what, 50, 60 years? Yeah, I opened 1763, which is really, really early. I mean, I'm sure there were some breweries around, but just to have documentation. Right, on course. that, and then closed 1827, all in the same building, as far as I could tell. So in the 1820s, a man named John Lauer moved his brewery from the suburbs of town, we'll say, from about 20 minutes outside to downtown, just to promote more business. And he was making ales and porters, which is really all you could make at this time. Because if you wanted to make a lager, you could not get that strain of yeast from... Germany, because the ships were not fast right. enough, it would it would go bad before they actually made the journey across the Atlantic. Huh. Yeah, so it would spoil or something. Yeah, it, it would exactly. Right. However, this changed because in the 1830s, we'll say clipper ships, which were these very fast clipper ships, got even faster, and the journey from England to the shores of, on the East Coast was uh, short enough that you could actually bring lager yeast over. So the first person to do this was a man named John Wagner, and he came to Philadelphia from Bavaria with the lager yeast. And he is credited with the first lager in America, and he actually taught a lot of people in the area as well. So Philadelphia and Pennsylvania continued to be a strong brewing state. And I didn't know this, but in a, a neighborhood called Northern Liberties, which is in Philadelphia, there's actually a historical marker that talks about John Wagner in the far, the first logger. You, you haven't been there? No, no, I, I didn't even know it. I, I, like, I didn't know the story before I researched it. Right. Um, but if you're living in Philadelphia, it's right by the Piazza, which is uh, an apartment complex with, I think it actually has a brewery underneath and some, some shops and some restaurants, and they have concerts inside. So it's pretty cool. And it's, it's weird. If you Google it, it's just literally in front of someone's house. Did it, like, did it used to be... Wagner's house, or it's just like this is a good spot. <laughs> I, I have no idea. It looks so weird. Let's assume that he once stood on this. Yeah, well, this Northern Liberties. Stupid. I think that was one of the, one of the older parts of town, so it's it's probable. Sure. Okay, so John Lauer is the the father that owned this brewery, and his son was called Frederick, and he actually took over the business from his father, and he became. A big player in the brewery scene in the country at that time. In 1851, Maine passes the first prohibition laws in the country, and Lauer actually said this about it, quote, it is a complete failure. It can be shown by statistics that almost every town in Maine has more drunkenness now than when before the prohibitory law was in place, end quote. So he did not like I mean, it. I, but I also like absolutely that he right? said this? No, no, that it's, that it was probably true. Oh, oh, yeah, I, I absolutely right, believe it too. It's illegal. Everyone wants to do it, and there's no regulation, and everyone's probably getting hammered on ninety percent moonshine <laughs> instead of this three percent beer or whatever. Right. right. Yeah. If you, I, I don't know if you ever watched the Ken Burns did a documentary about prohibition, like one of the PBS documentaries that's like ten episodes, and he just talks about how this was just such an economic strain for the country. Like, it, yeah. because during Prohibition, we had the Great Depression. And people think there were a lot right. of links between those two, so. Just the I fact. Mean, if I couldn't drink, I'd be. 
I <laughs> listen. Sorry, I w- I would be depressed during this time if I couldn't drink. Let's. I mean, let's be yeah, honest. That's, that's really interesting, though. I, and so Maine was the first. When uh, we've talked about this before, but I forget. I need to watch this documentary clearly. But that was 1851. You said when was. Like the... Nationwide was in 1920. 19... Wow. Okay. I know. That's, yeah, that's real early. And if, like, a lot of other states in the 1850s, they tried to pass it, but it, it didn't go through. Um, but I think Maine, I think they held on. And so... They were trying the whole... I, I, I haven't... I, I know you federal. you wanted to do an episode on Portland, Maine. Yeah, that would be cool. So if you look into that, we'll I, I don't know for sure. Yeah, if you look into sure. that, let me know. If if that is true, there's probably not a really great past brewing history in Maine. <laughs> you won't be able. To, I mean, it all been destroyed. Yeah. Okay, so he obviously did not like prohibition, so he became the first president of the United States Brewery Association, and they were formed in 1860 because the Civil War was breaking out and the government was imposing a federal tax on malt beverages, and this was the first time they've done this. So what happened is German-run breweries, they met in New York, and they formed this United States Brewery Association, voted Frederick Lauer as the first president, and they went to Congress, and they got them to actually change this tax. They lobbied. They lobbied, yes. So it was just on lager sales, though, because these were only German-run breweries that were making lager, and... They didn't, it didn't... Oh, the, the tax was only on lager beers. No, the tax was on everything but lager beers because they went to oh, Congress. They I lobbied. So they, yeah. they said, just let us do our thing. Right. However, yeah. the following year, they started to admit all the breweries that made ales and porters. So this group, they, they lobbied to the government, but they also funded trips to Europe to research how... The governments over there were imposing any taxes on malt beverages and they actually found that lower tax rates encouraged consumption and brought more revenue and it actually was high enough to discourage what i have written down here is crooked manufacturers from doing unsanitary practices so it was low enough not to hurt the breweries but it was high enough to get the 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 fake ones out of there yeah like make them put out product that's not going to be poisonous or whatever. Right, right. Well, as far as beer goes, yeah. So during the Civil War, they kept taxes on malt beverages low, while the taxes on liquor actually tripled. Hmm. Yep, to end this this whole story on Frederick Lauer, he actually received the first statue in Reading City Park. Hmm. And a number of workers that started at Lauer Brewery actually went on to open other breweries as well. Oh, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's... So he was really fundamental. When was this, when was this statue erected? I think it was, um, I want to say, d- during his time. What are we talking about? Okay, late, what, what late. Was was... Yeah, late 1800s. Okay. Yeah, and that's it. Okay, we are back. Sorry, we had to get a refill. John, what are you drinking tonight? Uh, I'm drinking Waco Ale Company's Pearly Gates Pale Ale. Mm, is it good? It is good. And I am drinking Bacchineer Rum Bach from Under the Radar. So support local. Okay, so we... Yeah, my, my cat's playing with her toy in the background. We'll just <laughs> it's, ignore it. It's fine. A lot of these have lady like shaking in the background and like just growling. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's fine. Mm-hmm. That's right. So we left off with... Frederick Lauer, and he owned Lauer Brewing Company, and that was the largest in the city. But they did have other competitors. One was Peter Barbie and Son Brewing Company. Its owner, Peter Barbie, was one of the former Lauer workers that we talked about that worked at the brewery and started his own. And that was founded in 1869. Another brewery at this time was Deppin Brewery. Uh, Owner William Deppin was actually the son-in-law to the original owner of this brewery and another big one that we'll talk about in more detail soon is the Reading Brewing Company founded in 1886. So around the turn of the century you had four really big breweries in town including other smaller ones that we just don't have information about. Okay so at the turn of the century a young man named Max Hassel 
He moved from Latvia to Reading, and he quit school as a teen to become a newsboy, which is meant he just gave out newspapers. Yeah. Uh, and then in, in his spare time with his friend, he started a hand-rolled cigar company. <laughs> so, <laughs> so out of those two businesses, he actually became a major player in Reading. So when Prohibition, Just from delivering papers and cigars. Mm-hmm, yeah, and and probably yeah, some business. other some other shady business. Yeah, good for him. Yeah. So when a, um, the prohibition came to Pennsylvania in 1920, they did not pass any laws before it became nationwide. So when it came to Pennsylvania, Max Hassel bought Reading Brewing Company, Lauer Brewery, and this new brewery called Fisher. So he became the ringleader of the black market beer in southeastern Pennsylvania. So he was definitely already doing a bunch of shady shit, delivering newspapers and cigars. If if on that, he was like, oh, I'm going to buy all these breweries and then operate them during Prohibition. See, I don't know from the article that I read if he bought them before, if he just bought them as like a business opportunity before Prohibition, or if he bought them after they were already closed. Like he just bought the space, all the equipment, yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, but... Reading became a big black market uh, capital because Phil- all of Philadelphia's breweries were quarantined. So all of it had to be bootlegged from Reading on the Reading Railroad down to Philadelphia. Wow. I know. We'll just go over the scenes at some of these breweries during Prohibition. Fisher Brewery, one of the ones that Hassel owned, employees were caught loading beer on trucks, and it was over the 1% near beer beer that was legal and that most breweries were producing. So in 1923, Fisher Brewery was closed and padlocked. So one of his breweries were down. The next one, Lauer Brewing Company. Employees were caught loading kegs onto train cars that were headed to Philly. And agents actually discovered 3,500 illegal barrels of beer inside the brewing company. So in 1924, Lauer was closed and padlocked as well. So he's down to just Reading Brewing Company. So two out of three are, are closed. Correct. One left. In 1924, the same year that Lauer was closed, uh, RBC, Reading Brewing Company, became the August Manufacturing Company, and they started to produce only, in air quotes, ice cream. So I, That's a thing, right? Like, lots of... But, yeah, uh, Yingling. Breweries doing this. Yeah, yeah, Yingling, mm-hmm. right, right, right. And, and uh, like, Yingling was it just because the facilities are, are easy to switch to ice cream? That, I don't know for sure, but that's what I would think. Like ice cream and like just dairy products in general, I think they probably use a lot of the same machinery. I mean, tanks and pumps yeah. and whatever, right? I you, don't know. Yeah, you do see that a lot. Probably. Right. But it was absolutely a front because agents toured the facility and they found behind <laughs> <laughs> they found behind a makeshift wall in the back beer that was at 4%. What a cool thing, though. I know. I love a makeshift wall. This would make a good, like... Just like investigative show, I feel like just this. Yeah. So. A show about prohibition. Yeah. Well, you know, of course, the, the cops will be the bad guys. Yeah. And then all the good guys are just like, I'm just trying to make four percent beer. What's the problem? Wow. Someone should like make a PBS documentary, like ten part series on prohibition. You know, I would probably not hear about that for a long time, and then maybe watch it if I was stuck in my apartment for a few months without being able to go anywhere. You make a good point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so instead of this, instead of uh, RBC being closed and padlocked like the other ones, Hassel got his lawyers involved and they stalled proceedings while okay. operations continued in the facility. A couple years later, U.S. Marshals actually visited again to shut down the operations, but Hassel took the initiative to padlock the door before them. And this was actually. Oh, so I got this. Mm-hmm. Don't worry. And this was, a, this was a common occurrence. Like, brewers who knew they were going to brew after Prohibition, they padlocked their doors so, like, no one could come in and, like, loot the place. Sure. But I think it was still illegal for them to, to get in there. One of the, the tales, I'm going to say, I don't know if this is true, one of the tales is that the deputy sheriff at the time was across the street when these marshals were trying to get in. And I think the deputy sheriff has the jurisdiction to enter. Um, but apparently he just smiled at them because Hassel was on his payroll. Yeah, of course, right? So, that's just a yeah, fun tale. Honestly, he probably was just like, fuck it, it's just beer. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, come on. 
Well, yeah, I, 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 he's probably drinking the beer that they're making in there. Right, yeah, yeah, of course. So I don't know, I, I didn't know from the article where any of these were located, which would be interesting just for me because I know that city so much, but I think it, it may have been lost, at least some of these, some of these locations may have been lost. Okay, so after this incident happened, they changed their name again to the Health Beverage Company, and Hassel actually put this man, Samuel Lunine, in charge. And he gave them, he gave, so everything was in this other guy's name, so he thought maybe the marshals would stop coming after him. I um, see, yeah, it's like, it's not me. Yeah, exactly. And these two actually yeah. met in secret in New Jersey. Like, it was that bad that they had to go to a different state and meet in secret. I see. Really, really shady shit. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the government continued to hassle, hassle, see, oh. see what I did there? So he moved to New Jersey full-time and teamed up with this man named Waxy Gordon. If that's not a freaking mob star name, I, I don't even know. Yeah. But the pair... I, I, I'm going to assume it's a nickname, but I don't want it to be. Waxy Gordon. <laughs> ah, it's just... probably like like he just overwaxed the crap out of his like mustache or something. Yeah. It was like derogatory or whatever, making fun of him. It's a pretty cool nickname, I think. Yeah, sure. Okay, so the pair of them actually controlled 17 illegal breweries in New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania. Eventually, Hassel moved back to the outskirts of Reading and held extravagant parties, so I think it was like a great Gatsby kind of scene during the, the, the Roaring Twenties here. Let's see. So, Prohibition was coming to an end. We're now talking about 1932-33. And Hassel was attempting to become a U.S. citizen because he wanted to be a, a an official brewer once it was legal to do so again. Yeah, that was for sure, right? That was legal. So he was with Waxy Gordon in a New Jersey hotel, and he was playing cards, and he was, you know, he was scheduled to go back to Reading, but he was just kind of, you know, BSing and just playing some cards, shooting shooting the the cards with his friends. This is a fa- this is a family show. I don't want to I don't want to say any words. But then an intruder came in and fatally shot him. So Max Hassel was dead only, I think it was like weeks before Prohibition officially ended. Wow. And You know, unless it was legal, though, he probably would have not been making nearly as much money. I know, but maybe he was like... like the market corner. Yeah, and maybe he was like turning a new leaf. And he was like, I just want to be a brewer, you know. I want to become a U.S. citizen. I mean, sure, it shouldn't have ever been illegal in the first place. I Mm. knew that. During his funeral, 20,000 people actually came to the viewing, which is crazy. Wow. Yeah. It's probably like every customer yeah. had. It just shows how big... No way, he only had 20,000. It shows like how, how big of a figure he was. Right, right, right. He didn't get a statue in City Park, but still 20,000 right. people. So more recent research actually suggests that Waxy Gordon may have been the true target. So maybe a little conspiracy Gordon. here. The guy... Mrs. Mark there. It's unfortunate. But as we said, Prohibition ended a few weeks later, and the Redding Brewing Company became the Old Redding Brewing. Old Redding. Old Redding Brewing. And they actually delivered the first beer to Philadelphia after Prohibition. So they tried some interesting marketing schemes. One was a failed throwback to the days before Prohibition, and they had hex signs on their... On their cans and logos, they had wooden furniture because there are some Amish communities nearby. There are still a lot of Germans there, so this would attract them. Um, uh-huh. And in a lot of the advertising that you see, there was a plump German man named Gus on it. Named what? Gus. G-U-S. Gus? Gus. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of fun. That's kind of fun. plump German beer man. Yeah, I, I would buy a can with a plump German man on it named Gus. It's probably really good. Uh, but it... It, as as fun as Gus probably was, it didn't work. So in the 1950s, they changed their their vision again, and they came up with this new slogan. It was friendly beer for friendly people. Oh, friendly people. That really limits your audience, though, if you gave, like, a test on how friendly people are. <laughs> That's right. Well, they actually changed it. They changed it to friendly beer for modern people. Oh, see, they mm-hmm. figured it out. Mm-hmm. They are like, ah, friendly people, that's a little too restrictive. Yeah, exa- exactly. So so the yeah. cans, they, they got rid of the hex signs and the, f- the furniture, and they had vibrant gold circles. So, And this is in the 1950s, so I, I, I think of it as like a Don Draper, Mad Men kind of 
conversation that they had about rebranding. Okay, yeah. Old Reading was the biggest at the time. They had competition with another brewery in town called Sunshine Brewing Company, and these were the only two that were big in the 1960s and 70s, but they both closed because they had pressure from the bigger companies and they just couldn't keep up with the them. National with the national brands, exactly. Um, so in 1976, Old Reading closed. The label was bought by a company in Philadelphia. The label had multiple stints with other companies, including one with Pabst. But then it was officially retired in the 1990s. Let's talk about some of the breweries that came about with this modern craft beer boom. The first one that I could find was founded in 1996. It was called Never Sink Brewery. Um, if you remember when we were in Reading, we hiked on Never Sing Mountain. Is that where the witch's house was? Where the witch's hat? Yep, that's where that is. Witch's hat, sorry, yes. And you get a good I view of that. Never from Never Sing Mountain, you get a good view of the pagoda. The what? The pagoda. The what? I'm sorry, the what? Uh, you, you know, the, the <laughs> Japanese temple. The, it makes sense that there's a pagoda in Reading, but it, red lights, and <laughs> yeah. it's beautiful at night. Red lights. It was very pretty. Mm-hmm. But I, yeah, I do remember that. You could really over, like, you could see the whole, you could see the whole, the whole town. city from there. Mm-hmm. It was really cool. Okay, so Never Sink Brewing, they sold in 2001, and they became Legacy Brewing Company. And at this time, Legacy actually revived the old Reading label. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. So this happened in 2006, but it was still a little bit too early, I think, for craft beer and Reading. Um, and these guys closed in 2009, and some of their beers were, were sold and made until pretty recently to a brewery up in New York. Okay, so the first one that was founded and is still around is Chatty Monks Brewing Company. Founded in two thousand yeah. founded in two thousand fourteen. It's a clever name, Chatty Monks. You know, it's like a play yeah. play on words. Founded two thousand fourteen, it was it's located in, in West Reading, which is across the Schuylkill River from downtown. And uh, I think I think we went there. Yeah, I think we did. That sounds familiar. It's like a nice like little brew pub. Good nachos. And if you go there you can have the Burke's English Ale which is a rated a 3.55 on untapped and it it honors the, the name of the county and also the first beers that were made in the area so it's kind of a fun name yeah that's neat. okay the next one that came around oak brook brewing company and we, we went there as well founded in 2016 it's located in a restored 1905 firehouse so if you go in there, you're actually sitting where the fire trucks were parked inside. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, I remember that one. That one's really neat. Yeah. We played some board games and stuff. It was a good time. It's cool because they have old pictures of the space when it was a firehouse. Right. Like really old pictures. So you can you can just yeah. put yourself in history. And it was it was very obvious on the outside that it was an old firehouse. Mm-hmm. You know, they, 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 cl- they kept that enough that, that they played on that. It was cool. Yeah, and I, I was just reading about them that a lot of it, it took them a lot of uh, persuading to actually convince the neighborhood that they should have a brewery. Really? Which seems to be a common theme with a lot of these. Like, people just don't want it in town, but it brings in a lot of people in commerce. So, it just doesn't make sense to me. Plus, like, if you live near, I'd love to live. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Right? Yeah, I agree. <laughs> so. The uh, beers that I wanted to highlight from them is the Hawk Mountain Red Ale, 3.64, and the Toon Trail Pale Ale, 3.50. And these are both named after local recreational destinations. And in 2019, they revived the Deppin label. If you remember, Deppin Brewery was one of the ones in the late 1800s. So they revived this label. If you go on their Facebook page, they have just a lot of history about that brewery that they've shared. Um, and even though they're using the label, they're they're making different recipes. So I I don't know I don't know why they bought this old label that no one really remembers instead of just using their label. Nostalgia, but Nostal- they're not. They don't have the recipes. So they're using yeah, new recipes. They, they're using new recipes, so they're really just using the name. And it, it's like a a buck, like a deer as a logo. I mean, that's cool. I really like that. They're doing that and sharing a history. Mm-hmm. Like you said, that that is very cool. I really I agree. like that. To keep that. I mean, that's the only reason we know about this stuff is people kept that alive. I agree. Uh, so that's really cool. And, you know, I don't think most people know about that brewery because the article that I got most of this information from, they, they barely mentioned Deppin. 
So hopefully they're going to bring to new light some of the, the history about that, and maybe we can revisit this. Yeah, that would be cool. Okay, continuing on, the next brewery that was open, Broken Chair Brewery, founded in 2017. It's located maybe a 5-10 minute walk from Chatty Monks in West Reading. And I think we went there as well. I believe you. I don't remember. Yeah, it's it's like a it's it's very narrow. It has a bar and some tables. It's pretty small. Uh, but they make I, I've never seen it on the menu. I think it was a limited release. Reading United Mango Mango Wheat three point six six. I thought that was the most unique unique name that they had, <laughs> yeah. and it was in partnership with the local soccer team, Reading United. So I assume some some of the funds went to. Sure. Is Reading United, I I hope their colors are somehow orange and something. I think they're, I think they're like red and black or something like that. Oh yeah. Okay. That makes sense. It's very, very amateur. Like they play at the local high school. (laughs) Look, I appreciate that though. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's great. Absolutely. Okay. The last one that we were talking about, Shaler Brewing Company. Founded in 2018, and it was founded by three guys who were just, like, in their mid-20s. And it is located a little... It has a Reading address. It's located on the outskirts of town in an old car dealership. But it, it, they refurbished it. It's, like, really nice. It, it, it looks like a big restaurant. And the cool thing about them, they were part of a group of pretty much all the breweries in the area that made Lowers, Lowers Fellowship Ale 3.76. And it honored, obviously, Frederick Lauer. And every $3.50 of this beer that was sold went to restoring his statue in City Park. Hmm. Yeah. That's neat. And uh, the recipe was led by Saucony Creek Brewery, which is up in Kutztown, only about 30 minutes from Reading. So you well, can... Like, yeah. Right just, it, very short. And so when they had the... the I, I don't know how, how I want to say it. When they had the restored statue unveiled a re-unveiling, they actually invited the same community band back to that that performed at the original statue unveiling. In the oh, really? 18, obviously, it's not the same people, but it's one of the right. oldest community bands in the country, and they got the same that's band cool. to come back. Yeah. yeah, that's really cool. And, you know, I've never seen this damn statue either. I didn't even know it existed. <laughs> so, next time I go well, home... You have something to do when you go home. Yeah, I want to look for the statue. I want to look for that historical marker in Philly. I just want to mention one more thing here before we wrap up. In 2019, Sly Fox Brewing Company out of Pottstown, which we mentioned, it's about, I'd say, 30 minutes with traffic away from Reading. They revived the old Reading brand. And it actually debuted in accordance with their new tap room, which is in Reading. And they made one beer. It was called Reading Premium. It only got a 3.23 on on tap, so I think it was kind of crappy. But I think it was—I think it's like a very light lager, so it it's probably tastes like a Bud Light. Uh, people are probably just biased. Yeah, I, I mean it's bad. It's just not. Well, when not you go to a craft awesome. when you go to a craft brewery, you you don't want like a light lager. But I appreciate I, I appreciate that they did it though. I mean it's pretty cool, and and sure. and they're they're actually canning it and selling it in stores, and they went with the the gold circles design instead oh, of yeah, yeah. instead of plump gus oh, which is kind of kind of sad they would throw it back even further i know no now do you remember uh brewers restaurant or brewers bar and restaurant remember we got the uh we, we sat at the table with with some of our friends there we got the pierogies the pierogies yeah 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 i think i left a review of that on yelp yeah yeah one of your best uh but one of my only <laughs> I don't know if you remember, but some of the walls, they actually have some old glasses and memorabilia from uh, the Reading Brewing Company. Oh, really? No, I don't remember that. And I always, just, I, I always, I mean, if you go to places in Reading, you, you'll see some of it around, but I was always like, what, like, what, what is this? And yeah, but now I know, that's cool. Now I know, yeah. And I think that's all, all I got for us on this episode. I wanted to make sure, since we're talking about Reading, that we plug my favorite Reading bar. Mm. Johnny and Hans. Johnny and Hans. Loved it. Located, I think it's on Old Kutztown Road. And go there, get a special, get a Yangling. It'll cost you like 50 cents. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what place 
was just great. I'm pretty sure you can still smoke inside. And I think their hours are actually 6 a.m. to 2 a.m. <laughs> if I remember correctly. Because they, they get a lot of people coming that work night shift. Like night shift, yeah. And they That's want a beer great. in the morning, yeah. Yeah. And uh, the only reason I found that, because one of our, our friend's dads went there and they used to have wing night on Friday and they have like the best wings and we would go there when we were like 17 for wings and people would like look at us and we'd see like hookers and stuff in there and it it was just like really great oh what a good time I know but yeah Johnny and Hans check it out they have have a pool table they have a a photo hunt machine but they also have like good they have good draft beer like they'll have like some of the Sly Fox the better Sly Fox beers on tap They'll they'll have some Trogues on tap from Hershey yeah so you can get your, your Bud Light or you can get a craft beer there. I, I like those places. Um, that can, Yeah, plenty of options. Mm-hmm. All right, any, any more last words? I, I think that's it for me. Awesome. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I know it was one of the longer ones, but I, I just really enjoyed it. I really researched it. You know, the episodes that you, the cities that you have been to or the cities that you have lived in are obviously a little bit easier to do and a little bit more exciting. So maybe you can do one on uh, League City. Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and remember to like us on Facebook and Instagram to keep up with our latest episodes. And that was another episode of Brewery Towns.